This is Kick-Ass Politics. I'm Ben Mathis. Kick-Ass Politics is sponsored by Fiverr. You've heard me rave about Fiverr before. That's Fiverr with two R's. Fiverr is the world's largest online marketplace for services, with over 100 categories all offered at a fixed base price of just 5 bucks. Logo design, business consulting, marketing, business cards and stationery, web design, translation, proofreading, legal consulting, and just about any other service you can imagine, all offered at a fixed base price of just 5 bucks. And right now, if you go to kickasspolitics.com and click on the Fiverr ad on our sponsor page, you'll be showing your support for the show and you'll get some great offers on services tailored to your needs. Whatever you need done, find it on Fiverr. And before we start the show, I want to ask for you, the listener's help with a special project. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be doing a listener survey to get a better idea of who our audience is. No matter how long you've been a listener or how frequently you listen to the show, we'd like to get to know you better and what you want. So I hope you'll visit our website at kickasspolitics.com and click on the listener survey link on the homepage, or there's a survey link in the show notes to this episode. It'll only take 60 seconds. We won't ask for your personal information or put you on some list. I'm not going to call you up at supper time or fill your email with spam, I promise. In fact, you can even fill out the survey anonymously if you want. It's just a few quick questions to help us understand who's listening, and seriously, it'll be a huge, huge help to me personally. Thanks in advance, folks, and now enjoy the podcast. Welcome to Kick-Ass Politics. I'm Ben Mathis. In the past month, the murder of a Syrian archaeologist by ISIS terrorists and the senseless destruction of two temples at the UNESCO World Heritage Site at Palmyra sent shockwaves through the archaeological community and drew huge media attention to what very well may be the biggest threat to the world's shared cultural heritage since World War II. These maniacs of the so-called Islamic State are rampaging through Syria and Iraq, blowing up historic monuments and priceless ancient statues. And what they don't destroy, they loot and sell on the black market in what is now their second biggest revenue source only behind oil. My guests on the podcast today are the men leading the charge to stop ISIS's war on cultural heritage and rescue some of the most important treasures of the ancient world before it's too late. Dr. Amr al-Azam is an associate professor of Middle East history and anthropology at Shawnee State University in Ohio. Before coming to the U.S., he served as the Director of Scientific and Conservation Laboratories at the General Department of Antiquities and Museums in Syria, and as head of the Center for Archaeological Research at the University of Damascus. Since the outbreak of the Syrian Civil War, he's become an active member of the Syrian opposition, those are the good guys, folks, and he's chairman of the Heritage Task Force, which seeks to prevent the looting and destruction of Syrian monuments and antiquities. And later in the show, I'll talk with Roger Michael Jr. He's the founder and executive director of the Institute for Digital Archaeology, which is using some high-tech gadgets to catalog ancient monuments and artifacts in hopes of recovering and restoring them one day for future generations. Folks, if you thought Indiana Jones had his hands full with those Nazis, then just listen to what these men have to say about their race to protect the ancient wonders of the world before they're wiped off the face of the planet by a psychopathic terrorist army hell-bent on destruction. Coming up in just a moment. Hollywood to Washington, it's time for Kick-Ass Politics. And now here's your host, Ben Mathis. Dr. Amr al-Azam is currently Associate Professor of Middle East History and Anthropology at Shawnee State University in Ohio, and he's Chairman of the Syrian Opposition's Syrian Heritage Task Force. Dr. al-Azam, you were one of the leading archaeologists in Syria prior to the outbreak of civil war. You've personally excavated and explored many of these sites, including the ancient city of Palmyra. 
what went through your mind when you saw this video on, in the news of ISIS tearing through Palmyra, blowing up these magnificent, nearly thousand-year-old temples of Bel and Baal Shemin? Well, obviously, I'm devastated. I mean, Palmyra is really uh, one of our most important archaeological sites and a, a very important symbol of Syria's uh, long and 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 uh, very rich, you know, cultural heritage. Um, uh, in particular, Palmyra, uh, you know, has. Uh, because of its location in the desert, it's an oasis in the desert, it means that it has unique um, preservation conditions uh, due to the very arid um, climate there. And so the preservation is very high, and it's been a, an amazing site that has yielded so much information and knowledge about the period that it represents, which is primarily, the, the you know, this is we're talking about the Roman period here from 1st century to 3rd century um, A.D., Remember, Palmyra is a site that essentially encompasses an entire Roman city. So there are many public buildings, you know, palaces and so on and so forth. And they are all under threat at the moment. Uh, somewhere along the way, you said that the ancient city of Palmyra and probably other historic sites are in relative safety. And ISIS is not completely destroying them because they plan on using those cities as, I guess, the equivalent of a human shield if uh, if the allies go after them yes they do and we have evidence of that they would use or they have plans to use at least some parts of palmyra for that but we also know that they're already using the site of rasafa near raqqa which is a rasafa is a is this large palace complex dating back from the uh, byzantine and uh, you know early islamic uh, period the umayyad period um they're using the uh, citadel of Jabar, and they understand the importance of uh, of these sites, and they also know that they can be used as a, a safe haven from coalition airstrikes. Besides Palmyra, what are some of the worst cases of ISIS's destruction of historical sites in Syria and Iraq? Obviously, some of the most uh, most prominent, as in you know, because these are the sites that ISIS has not only destroyed um, but have made a public spectacle of their destruction. That includes the museum in Mosul in, in Iraq, the site of Hatra uh, and, and Nimrud, um, where we saw those uh, giant lamassu, those winged lion um, uh, you know, statues with a human head being sort of uh, taken down and destroyed with angle grinders and, and sledgehammers. Um, in, in Syria, uh, you know, the most prominent thus far has been the uh, blowing up of the, the you know the temple of Bel and just before that um, the temple of Baal Shamin, but there is also a, another very important area of destruction that's occurring um, by ISIS and others, and that's uh, as a result of the looting, the the, the ongoing looting of archaeological sites, which ISIS, um, when it started to take over these large areas, essentially. Uh, came upon this looting and institutionalized it and 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 uh, you know accelerated the process and intensified it uh, and essentially raised it to an industrial level. And the damage it causes is incredible as well. Right, and I believe that those were the exact words that the director of UNESCO used. She said it was looting on an industrial scale. So then break it down for us. Walk us through the journey of a stolen Syrian artifact from the looting to the end buyer. It starts off with uh, the looters on a, on a site. Once they've recovered or uncovered a piece, let's say it's a piece of mosaic, a mosaic floor, they will remove it. And then they will begin the process of touting, or if you want, um, uh, essentially uh, showing the piece to prospective buyers. One of the commonest ways this is done is through a telephone application known as WhatsApp, where you can send images and text messages for free, and you can upload fairly large images through that. That's why it's very popular. Um, if the uh, buyer is interested, a lengthy process will or negotiation will begin with the tout in the hope of, you know, getting... A, as much information as they can about the piece, and in the case of the middleman here, trying to make sure that you know he gets the best possible uh, commission for himself out of the deal. Eventually, at some point, the owners of the of the actual looted 
item and the buyer will meet. This can occur in, in, in Turkey or uh, in some cases in Lebanon. You know, Lebanon is a much more established exit route for, for Syrian antiquities. And then, you know, obviously there's going to be more negotiations. And if the deal is struck, the uh, object is handed over to the buyer. And then it's up to the buyer to sort of figure out how they're going to get it out of the country. That said, a lot of the buyers are dealers themselves or representatives of, you know, I would say wealthy collectors who then or have their own well-established means of uh, moving uh, the, the, the artifact that they have purchased. Um, very little, I would like to say, of these artifacts is actually showing up on the inter international market as yet. Well, in, in some cases, because there is so much scrutiny that's being put on these sales, many of these antiquities are going to buyers who have the resources to be able to store that purchase for 10 to 15 years before even considering putting it back on the market. Does this give you some concern that, that you may never yes, see these things again, and by the time they reemerge, no one will care, frankly? Look, that's exactly what we think is happening. This is the pattern. Okay, we've seen it before with the Iraqi um, uh, looted antiquities from 2003 to 2005. Um, only now are some of these pieces slowly beginning to, uh, you know, seep out or come out onto the market. Um, the buyers, as I just mentioned to you, are probably specialized dealers who have, uh, let's say, deep enough pockets or the ability to acquire these objects, sit on them for 5, 10, 15 years, possibly even longer, to wait for the attention on these pieces to die down or just sort of be distracted elsewhere. Then these pieces will uh, maybe get sold on a few times um, just to make sure that they acquire some sort of provenance, some sort of sales history. And every sale or every transaction essentially moves it one step further away from its a rather uh, um, unfortunate origin, and as it does so, it also increases its value. So you're probably going to see these pieces sit for quite a long time in someone's basement, and if they do get sold on, they'll get sold on to another dealer who's willing to also sit on them. Uh, it's a process of uh, uh, laundering, if you want, money laundering. You know, you're, you're washing these pieces out until they 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 lose that kind of fresh out of the earth feel to them. They lose that kind of smell of, I come from a looted site and they acquire a little more respectability. And then eventually you might see them coming back onto the mainstream market through one of the main auction houses. It certainly is an elaborate process and they seem to have some kind of infrastructure to all this. Um, I was interested to read that you've been doing some undercover work of your own here and luring out these shady dealers trafficking in stolen artifacts. Uh, without giving away too many secrets, tell me this. As a guy here in America with no real contacts in the antiquities market, armed with nothing but a computer, how easy would it be for me to find someone who will sell me looted Syrian or Iraqi artifacts online? I, I think it's fairly easy. I, most of these um, uh, middlemen, if you want, this is how most of this information arrives. Most of these uh, middlemen... Um, usually, um, as soon as they hear that someone is interested, they will immediately start to send you uh, photographs or images um, through WhatsApp um, of whatever available material they have for sale. And, uh, you know, word will get around that you're, you're an interested person, and, and you'll get that anyway. A lot of us get these images all the time, and some of them actually openly advertise on <laughs> Facebook. There are at least a couple of Facebook really? sites, I believe, um, which seem to come on and then disappear because, you know, Facebook realizes what's going on. They shut them, you know, they close down the accounts and then they reopen again. So it's it's not that difficult for your average person to actually, you know, get access to this information without too much trouble, I should say. So in your investigations, have it, has it been a case where you contact them or they contact you? Uh, actually, a bit of both. Sometimes it's us who contact them. Sometimes it's them who contact us. It's not such a secretive thing. Well, once you make contact with a middleman or a dealer and you identify something is stolen, what's the next step for you? 
well, there's not much we can do about it. Remember, we are not a law enforcement agent. I, I am not a law enforcement agency. Yeah. I have no jurisdiction. I can't go out and play <laughs> cops and robbers on someone else's um, patch. Yeah. Um, for me, the prime purpose of getting this information is to just create a database or a, a record of what's out there that's being stolen and then sold in the hope that one day we may be able to recover it. Yeah, and one of the ironies of all this is that this explosion of stolen artifacts on the black market, most of which have pretty dubious provenance, has also given birth to a huge boom in the business of counterfeits here in Iraqi artifacts. Yes, very much so. And a lot of it actually comes out of Bulgaria, of all places. Oh, huh. There's a roaring industry in making fake coins in Bulgaria. They'll then come out of Bulgaria, they all get mixed in, and then the next thing you know, you're being offered this horde of coins, maybe... Huh. Two thirds are fake and maybe one third are real. Well, in a weird way, does this kind of help your cause if it yes, makes it does, dealers more because, skeptical of, of goods um, coming out of there? Yes, it does. Because uh, the more the waters get muddied, the, the more difficult it is for dealers to kind of figure out what's real, what's not real, the harder it gets for these um, dealers to sell stuff on. Remember, this is very much a supply and demand driven market as well. If there's too much supply, then, you know, the demand kind of gets sort of confused and and it goes down. If there's not enough supply, then the demand will go up. Uh, so we know what motivates all the looting, but explain what it is about the religious ideology of ISIS that's behind so much of this senseless destruction of so many ancient statues and historic sites. I think it's important for us to uh, distinguish between the different types of destructive acts that ISIS commits. And that's the one that specifically targets, you know, Shiite Islamic shrines or, 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 or uh, uh, religious monuments or buildings uh, that are um, belong to other uh, religions, other sects. You know, this takes itself back to their Salafist, Wahhabist, roots where they believe that Islam has somehow become polluted through this these practices that have somehow crept in, which they consider to be un-Islamic, and that they have to be purged, they have to be eliminated, and only through such a process can the true Islam, the Islam of, of if you want, the Prophet Muhammad, will then shine through, and through that then Islam will regain its old glories. And so for them, that act of eliminating everything that they consider to be heretical, schismatic, or, or uh, un-Islamic from their own perspective becomes an necessary act. That's one type of destruction that they can... But then there's another type of destruction. When it comes to the destruction of ancient sites and uh, artifacts from museums, what they're doing here is they're committing what I refer to as an atrocity class action. The specific purpose here is to demonstrate ISIS's ability to act with impunity and the impotence of the international community to respond. Often these actions, these atrocities, whether they're against cultural heritage or against the types of uh, executions when they take people in orange jumpsuits and they, you know, they, they put them in cages and set them on fire or drown them, all of these are part of the same repertoire and they serve the same purpose. And ultimately ISIS uses them for propaganda purposes, and also to deflect attention away perhaps from uh, military setbacks that they may have recently suffered on the battlefield, or to just to remind their own public and the world at large that they're still there and they're still powerful. That's fascinating because, you know, the justification they keep using is for all the destruction of, particularly of statues, is that it's un-Islamic, this whole thing of idolatry. Is yes. that just an excuse? Is it, is it really not ideological? But, it's just propaganda? In my opinion, I believe that it is. And wow. be simply because look at all their atrocity class actions, whether it's Jihadi John beheading a, a prisoner in an orange jumpsuit, or it's uh, a group of ISIS fighters going into a museum and smashing up its contents. There's always some sort of religious justification for to justify the committing of the atrocity. So the atrocity is not committed to fulfill a religious need, the justification comes 
um, over the, the atrocity to try and justify why they had to commit the atrocity. And that's, there's a big difference with that. So, yeah, so all of these lofty ideals that they use to justify all of this is just really a lie. And if, well, it's not so much a lie as much as a, a abuse of the justification. Yeah. Let's put it this yeah. way. Because, to, you know, the fact that idols should be destroyed is part of their belief system. But does that extend to, uh, you know, cultural heritage? No, it does not. It extends to the worship of idols. Are people worshiping these idols today? No, they're not. So there's no reason for them to destroy them. I wow. mean, you know, it's, it's... That's a good point. It's it's very bogus. And like I said, the, the justification, you know, they commit an atrocity and somehow they need to justify it to themselves and to their people. So they add, they, sort of, they superimpose this justification on the atrocity. They're not committing the atrocity to fulfill a religious requirement because it doesn't work that way. Well, a moment ago, you mentioned uh, the fact that the, the international community isn't doing enough. Um, in the past year, the UN passed a resolution banning the sale of stolen artifacts from Syria and Iraq. And the U.S. Congress followed suit with similar legislation banning the import and sale of looted objects. What more do you think needs to be done at that level? At that level, I think, in the sense of passing these resolutions, I mean, these are very important landmarks, I think. The fact that now um, both sellers and buyers are going to be held accountable for their actions, I think that's very important. But will that have an immediate impact on preventing or stopping looting? No, it won't. Looting is, is happening very, very far away from where these auctions or where this buying and selling is occurring. But when I talk about needing to do more, I'm talking about supporting those people on the ground today that are actually trying to save this cultural heritage. I'm talking about the young men and women, the archaeologists, the uh, museum uh, curators, the activists who are risking their lives going out trying to document these um, violations, this looting. They're trying to protect their museums. They're, they're, they're doing what they can. And I'm talking about supporting these uh, people. And ultimately, if we really want to stop this carnage of the heritage, it can only be stopped if we also stop the carnage that is befalling the people who are part of this heritage. So if you really want to talk about doing something to end this, then we have to also do something about ending the war in Syria and in Iraq and so on and so forth. And that's something, you know, <laughs> far great, far larger than you know, anything that we can sort of say or discuss here. That, that, that's a very big topic in its own right. Well, you mentioned these people who are actually over there in Syria risking their lives to rescue these artifacts and sites. Uh, you're working very closely with them. Tell me more about who they are and the kind of things that they're doing on the ground there. You know, uh, in Syria, there are uh, numerous young men and women, uh, archaeologists, museum curators, and, and, and activists who believe that their cultural heritage is worth saving. And so they risk their lives every day um, going out there trying to document violations, acts of looting, or damage being caused by the actual conflict itself. And in uh, some cases, they even manage to maybe save uh, an item here or uh, a, a piece of antiquity there. One of our best examples comes from the city of Marra, has a small local museum. In that museum, there happens to be one of the most important collections of mosaics in Syria. It comes from the UNESCO-designated World Heritage uh, uh, sites of the uh, dead cities, and the collection in there is absolutely fabulous. But because the city of Mara has been subjected to a very intensive barrel bombing campaign for the last year and a half, we, we both we outside and more importantly, the local archaeologists and activists in the city of, of Mara were very concerned about the safety of these mosaics. In the end, we managed to put together a small fund that would uh, help pay for the sandbagging of the museum. A few months later, after we finished sandbagging the museum, the museum was barrel bombed and it destroyed a part of the museum. And uh, But the mosaics were all saved. Those mosaics that were sandbagged inside the museum were all saved, the important ones, and because of their efforts. 
And it's really not an exaggeration when we say that they are risking their lives. Because just a couple of weeks ago, as many people probably saw in the news, uh, a very prominent Syrian archaeologist named Khalid Assad refused to tell ISIS where he and others had hidden supposedly hundreds of ancient statues. And as a result, ISIS beheaded him and hung his mutilated body from one of the ancient columns in Palmyra as a warning to others. Now, Khalid Assad was a friend and a colleague of yours. What went through your mind when you heard about his murder? Uh, he was a colleague of mine. I mean, first of all, you know, it is, it's a terrible loss. And uh, the man really had, um, you know, an incredible amount of knowledge of Palmyra um, of the sort that you can only acquire through practical experience of being there for so many decades. And we've lost that. Uh, in terms of the hidden loot and treasure, uh, we know that the, the museum in Palmyra was evacuated, you know, hours with, before um, ISIS kind of moved into the city. So, and we know of archaeologists, um, you know, arrested and questioned in other towns and cities in Syria under ISIS control. And now, unfortunately for them, they were later released. In the case of Khalid al-Assad, he was released and re-arrested and finally executed. Yeah, I mean, it's a horrible, horrible tragedy that these monsters have committed. But hopefully, thanks to the work that you and others are doing, uh, he won't have died in vain. Uh, well, Dr. Al-Azam, thank you for coming on the show, and thanks for everything that you're doing to protect the world's cultural heritage from these mad ghouls. Um, before we go to break, I was very interested in what Dr. Al-Azam had to say about just how easy it is to procure stolen antiquities from Syria online. So I decided to see for myself just how easy it might be for a guy like me, with no connections in the antiquities trade whatsoever, to track down and purchase stolen artifacts from Syria. Uh, first, I went on Facebook, and I found a number of Facebook page and private groups that appear to be advertising ancient Assyrian, Roman, Sumerian, Mesopotamian artifacts, coins, and statuary that appear to have come from Syria and Iraq. Now, some of them are more discreet than others. Some disguise their pages as educational sites that mix in photos of antiques uh, from, say, the British Museum with photos of items that are available by inquiry. Uh, I also took a gander on eBay, where I found coins and antiquities even coming from the very cities that ISIS has sacked, like Mosul and Hatra. I'll post some photos of these listings in the show notes on the website, and you can judge for yourself. Um, certainly there are red flags there and don't be fooled when they say it comes with a certificate of authenticity. First of all, anyone can print up a certificate of authenticity. It isn't worth the paper it's printed on. And that only guarantees that the piece isn't fake. That's not a certificate of provenance and it doesn't show chain of custody of the piece and it doesn't protect you one bit against knowingly or unknowingly purchasing stolen goods. So as the ancients would say, Caveat emptor, my friends. Caveat emptor. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and then when I come back, I'll talk with a man named Roger Michael, who's head of a group that's putting cutting-edge technology into the hands of everyday Syrians and Iraqis in an effort to beat ISIS to the punch and save some of the world's most precious historical treasures before it's too late. Coming up after the break. This portion of the podcast is brought to you by Audible. Audible has over 180,000 audiobooks available to download for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And right now, Kick-Ass Politics listeners can get a free audiobook download and a free 30-day trial. Just go to audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics. Or click on the sponsor link on our webpage at kickasspolitics.com and go get your free audiobook. And if you like Kick-Ass Politics and want to help keep us on the air, then please support the show by making a donation to our GoFundMe campaign at GoFundMe.com backslash kickasspolitics. Or go to the show website and click on the donate link. Your support will help keep us producing new and interesting programs in the future. That's GoFundMe.com backslash kickasspolitics. And now, back to the show. Welcome back. 
In the second half of the podcast, I'm talking with Roger Michael Jr., the founder and executive director of the Institute for Digital Archaeology. Roger, you're behind something called the Million Image Database Project, which is being called a modern-day version of the Monuments Men, who were the soldiers who rescued stolen art from the Nazis in World War II. Uh, I have to say, on the one hand, I wish that there wasn't this urgent need for a program like this, but there's also this techie geek side of me who thinks, wow, this is really, really a cool idea. So, Roger, tell me more about what the IDA is doing with this project. Well, I think you're right. It really has uh, captivated people's imagination in a way that I, I couldn't have anticipated. I also agree with you that it is uh, a very sad situation that we're even involved in this enterprise. Uh, to give you a little background, uh, what we're doing uh, today as part of the Million Image Database Project is more or less what the organization has been doing throughout its entire history. That is to say, we've been involved in the high technology imaging business uh, and its intersection with archaeology since the outset. Uh, it was about, I guess, nine months ago that we realized that our work in documenting uh, epigraphy, that is inscriptions and archaeological uh, objects in the field, uh, could play a significant role in, uh, in cultural heritage preservation. And it was a, at about that time that I conceived of the Million Image Database Project, specifically the idea of flooding the region with these low-cost, easy-to-use, three-dimensional cameras uh, that would allow for 3D captures and create the possibility down the road of recreations. Uh, and so we, uh, we entered into a collaboration with uh, uh, Oxford University, with whom we've collaborated in the past on a number of successful ventures, uh, specifically with uh, Dr. Alexei Karanovska uh, on the physics faculty there. And uh, she and her team did a great job of coming up with uh, both hardware and software that was uh, well adapted to this purpose. Uh, and sitting here today, nine months later, we have a, a great product, a great camera. Uh, we're ordering them now uh, by the thousands from uh, our uh, factory in China. And, uh, and getting them to our uh, associates uh, in the field uh, in Iran, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, uh, Afghanistan, Turkey, uh, Jordan, and our very high hopes uh, for meeting all of the benchmarks for success that we've established. So this project isn't just limited to Syria? Absolutely not. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, I'm sure you've seen the very uh, disheartening satellite imagery coming out of Syria today, indicating that the Temple of Bel and most of the important architectural features of Palmyra now uh, lie in, in rubble uh, in the city. So unfortunately for some of those Syrian sites, uh, this project has come along too late. Um, but in fact, as you say, our, uh, our, uh, our mandate is much broader than that. The enterprise is much broader than that. And we intend to uh, do our best to capture as many uh, images as we can throughout the Middle East of these important sites. Uh, our hope is to have a million images in the bank by the end of this year and 5 to 10 million images in the bank by at the end of 2016. To jump back to Palmyra, I said uh, it may not be too late for that site because in the last three to four weeks, as it became clear that uh, we were not going to get into uh, Palmyra anyway, uh, in time to capture 3D images of that site with the hope of possibly uh, doing some recreations uh, in the future, uh, we got to work on the possibility of using the existing 2D photographs from that site. It's been very well documented over the years by, by scholars and by folks who have visited the site. Uh, and, and to see if we couldn't, using the, uh, the, the mass of 2D imagery that we have, uh, create some 3D models of the important uh, structures on the site. And I can tell you, uh, today we are uh, nearly 100% confident, in fact, I'll say 100% confident, that we will be able to, using the uh, 2D images, uh, create 3D models that we can incorporate into our 3D database that could be used for uh, three-dimensional recreations in the future. Wow, well, that's really good news. Um, so who are you trying to get these cameras to uh, on the ground, and how do you even begin to get them in the right hands in the middle of an ongoing civil war in places like Syria and Iraq? To answer your question, we, we're working at, at both ends of a very big spectrum. So at one end, we're working with UNESCO, and so they will be assisting us uh, with distribution efforts using their infrastructure. And of course, I, you know, it's a major international NGO. They have a lot of boots on the ground, as it were. We're very hopeful that they will be of great assistance in getting large numbers of cameras into the field. Um, and we'll, we're also working with uh, smaller organizations that are, are uh, still in that uh, NGO end of the spectrum, like um, there's one in Oxford called Enhanced Archaeology. Uh, we've struck a partnership with them. They'll be providing us with uh, 200,000 images from Jordan. So 
Uh, so large organizations like that are going to be invaluable in this task. At the other end of the spectrum, Mr. Altshuler is working with uh, collaborators that we have been uh, working with over the course of the history of our uh, organization. Uh, that is over the last five to six years, and these are local antiquary societies, uh, small museums, uh, local archaeologists, embedded archaeologists from other countries. Uh, so it's going to be a, a long list of lots of individuals who are going to be handling cameras a half dozen at a time, perhaps passing them along to their associates uh, with some sites, with many of the smaller sites, I should say. I think each site is going to have its own particular story in terms of how the camera got into the site and how the images were collected. So it's, it's an interesting study in contrast. On one end, we're dealing with folks like UNESCO who are uh, consummate professionals in undertaking uh, things like this on this scale. And at the other end, we're dealing with individuals like, like Mr. Al-Assad who are just passionate about their local cultural patrimony and, and are willing to do whatever it takes to preserve it. Well, so these cameras are particularly easy to operate then? That was part of the brief that we gave to Dr. Karanovska when we, uh, when we tasked her with producing the hardware and the software for this project. We needed a camera that was uh, discreet, uh, robust, that resembled an ordinary camera so it wouldn't, be, wouldn't call any unnecessary attention to the user. Uh, and we also needed a camera that was simple to use, basically point and shoot. And we also needed a, uh, a, a, an internet interface, a Wi-Fi interface that was going to be more or less automatic. So. Um, We've done, I think she's done a fabulous job uh, with, with that. The camera is all of the things that I just described. Uh, it, uh, it seems to be working well. Uh, the initial reports are very good. Uh, the Wi-Fi interface seems to be working. So, uh, so this, that, that we've, I think we've hit a home run on the, uh, on the, the technical side. And having said that, uh, you know, perforce, we're, we're getting thousands of cameras into the field. Some folks have said, well, gee, you know, how, how high is the quality? How good is the resolution? Needless to say, if we have these objects in the laboratory and we're using state-of-the-art uh, laser-driven 3D uh, imaging scanners, we'd obviously get a higher degree of resolution. But in terms of what we're trying to accomplish to document these objects, to create the possibility for recreations, especially architectural recreations in the future, there's plenty of resolution there. And uh, more important, these cameras are, are of a type uh, that can be as you say, used effectively by relatively unskilled users. Well, I was also interested when you said that they're discreet, because I'll tell you, my concern would be it won't take very long you know, for ISIS to figure out what these things are. And if 5,000 Syrians suddenly start popping up with some fancy piece of technology that sticks out like a sore thumb, it's just going to put a target on their backs. So these are, these are very, they, do they look like ordinary cheapo cameras? Yes, in fact, the, the factory where they're being produced uh, is using as the base uh, for the housing and so forth a very commonly used uh, camera housing uh, in, in, among inexpensive uh, uh, consumer-grade digital cameras. So these are, they will, they will at a glance, uh, look like any other small handheld digital camera that uh, any uh, the, the average person might have. And indeed, these sites are always filled with people who are uh, taking pictures, quite a common occurrence, as you can imagine. So we've done everything we could uh, on, on that front, and people certainly understand the risks very well. Uh, as Mr. Al-Assad demonstrated in, uh, in Palmyra uh, the week before last, uh, people are willing to take chances to preserve something that they feel is a significant part of their history and of their uh, daily personal experience. Well, there's no doubt that these people that you're working with are risking their lives for this. Let's talk about, you know, worst case scenario, Ho you know, hopefully you never have to even use these images, but worst case scenario, ISIS or, or whoever uh, destroys a temple or some kind of monument and you have to then rebuild it. Talk about that process on the other end with the 3D imaging. With the Absolutely. 3D imaging. Well, you know, what I would say just first very quickly is that this database will have a tremendous amount of utility, whether or not it's ever used for 3D reconstruction. This is still a way for scholars to have access to this uh, information. It's a way for, for ordinary people who want to appreciate the history to have access. The database will be stored at NYU's Institute for the Study of the Ancient World. That's the current plan. It'll be open source, available to anyone who wants to access it. We're going to set it up in Wikipedia style so that folks that have additional images, or field notes, or other information about these sites that they want to append to the data that we put on the site, they'll have the opportunity to do that. So it'll be a, a true uh, global resource that uh, governments, individuals, anybody who wants to access this data in the future, they'll be able to do it. 
a local municipality wants to raise the money to rebuild a statue that was destroyed and wants to use our data set to do that, they are absolutely welcome to do that. Uh, so we're not, we're not, uh, we're not going to be forcing this on anyone. But I have to say that for, for my money, um, when you remove these visible uh, reminders of the past from the landscape, it's very quickly thereafter that people begin to forget about the past. And so, again, for my money, I'm very much in favor of thoughtful uh, recreations using this data. Uh, the Vienna Convention set out certain uh, requirements for uh, the recreation of antiquities. We're a very strong believer that, as the Vienna Convention specifies, original materials should be used. It's very important that things are true to the spirit. Oh, it's very important that things don't pass themselves off as real when they're recreations, that they be properly identified. But beyond that, I think it's very important to retain in the landscape these visible reminders. Okay, so so when you so when you use these three D printers, you're not just necessarily dealing in some type of resin or plastic. Uh, so. So, no, so, so you're not going to have something that looks like it was made with Legos, right? No. So in fact, the the, the, the exciting opportunity that we have, and again, consistent with the, uh, with, with, the, with the Venice Convention, is to actually go into these sites to use the rubble from the destroyed structures to fabricate the concrete that will be used to replicate them. And in fact, concrete, wow. whether folks realize it or not, was a very common building material during Roman times. These structures that you see that are often mistaken for stone are very often concrete. And so we'd be rebuilding them in the same manner and using the same very concrete that was used in the original structures uh, to, to recreate them. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, it's a horrible thing that we're talking about this. It's hard to believe. I mean, it would be like someone said, well, gee, you know, Washington is lying in rubble. Should we recreate the Capitol building? Should we recreate the Washington Monument? I mean, it makes you heart sick to even think about those things. And, and then when you do, it kind of gives you some empathy for the people in Palmyra and places like that. But I can tell you that if someone did destroy the Washington Monument, it would rise from the rubble in the same way that the at the site of the Twin Towers, the, the, that that beautiful new structure has 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 risen from the from the ashes. And I think that's how people uh, re recover, it's how they recover their uh, sense of, of pride in, in their history. And I think it's a, it's a very important undertaking, and this will make that at least possible if people want to do it. The other aspect to this is that you want to document artifacts before they're looted and sold so that you have a record and you're hopefully able to recover these. Um, provenance is very tough to prove with these types of things. How will this technology help you to identify stolen antiquities that hit the market or possibly wind up in someone's collection? Yeah, I mean, that's obviously a, a huge a secondary purpose uh, for this for this project. Uh, so the answer is this, that the, uh, the images that we'll be making, especially of the kinds of smaller objects that would be most likely to be sold in the galleries of Davies Street in London uh, will be documented to a very high degree of resolution. Uh, the visual images will include metadata uh, that, that documents uh, GPS location, time and date. Uh, and so uh, once they are in the database, there will forever be a, a record of the object at a level of resolution that it will in fact be possible uh, to, uh, to uh, identify uh, stolen objects with the images in our database. And, uh, and I think that in terms of what the FBI and Interpol are doing right now, which is stepping up considerably their policing of the black market sale of antiquities, especially those coming out of the Middle East at this time, uh, this could become something that will be a, an important uh, part of their, uh, uh, their, their, their forensic resources. So we're very excited about that possibility. And if it does hold that potential, my hope is that it will have a deterrent effect today uh, in terms of whether or not, look, if the middlemen decide there's too much risk associated with purchasing these objects because down the road the chain of custody is going to become transparent and they're going to be implicated in this, it may well reduce the demand for the objects today. And once it does that, just like ivory and exotic woods, Lucites, uh, that's reduced the demand for those kinds of objects and therefore reduce the on-the-ground destruction, then it could have that same effect with antiquities. I've heard it said that antiquities are the second largest revenue stream for ISIS behind oil. And with the coalition airstrikes disabling many of the ISIS-controlled oil fields and refineries, is it becoming a higher strategic priority for ISIS to take control of areas of particularly high historical value? It certainly seems that way to me. Uh, if you sit down and take a look at the map of areas where they have uh, focused their efforts, uh, it certainly seems like they are trying to capitalize on the, the opportunities uh, to seize and then sell uh, antiquities. Uh, so I, I, I certainly don't want to try to get inside their minds because it's uh, possible for me to do that. But I think the, uh, uh, the record speaks for itself. Uh, 
the there is no question, and uh, the FBI, I think, made an announcement last Friday about uh, its own efforts to step up uh, intervention. So they certainly are, are, are sensing the same things that we're uh, theorizing about here right now, that there is has been a significant increase in the, uh, the pilfered antiquities trade. And uh, I have to think that if the, the oil money is drying up, given the uh, financial opportunities the illegal sale of antiquities represents, and some people are estimating that it's in the tens of millions of dollars per month in terms of things that are coming out of ISIS-held territories, and that has to be has to be one of their, their priorities in terms of uh, their strategic initiatives. Uh, what are some of the sites that you're most concerned about that are most urgent for you right now? Do you know what, what what's on ISIS's wish list, I guess? Well, this is a question we frequently get asked, and we've worked with UNESCO to develop a list of priority sites based on our own sense of what uh, of what is likely to be high on our opponents' uh, list of priorities. But we've made it a policy not to disclose uh, the sites that we intend to focus on specifically, well, for two reasons. One, because we, we don't want our hit list to become their hit list, number one. <laughs> and number two, we don't want to place anybody at risk who's working at those sites on our behalf to collect images. So we, we're not disclosing any information about specific sites that we're, that we're either operating in, have operated in recently, or are targeting for the future. Well, yeah, that completely makes sense. You don't you, you don't want to do their work for them. <laughs> Tell them exactly what are the most right, I mean, important I sites people, and valuable uh, sites. Tend to uh, <laughs> impute uh, a lot of sophistication to these organizations because they, you know, at some level they they, they it's reflected in what they do. Uh, the reality is there's not a lot of sophistication there. I'm not sure how good their information is. I'm positive that our information is better. I can tell you that because we have the best archaeological minds in the world assisting us. Uh, so you're absolutely right. There's no way in the world we want to disclose uh, what we know to them so that they can, as, as I say, make, make our hit list their hit list because uh, it, would be a, it would be a blueprint for them. Do you think that Palmyra was a turning point for your cause? Well, I think that it, it helped, certainly helped to sharpen the focus. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, re the reality is that, uh, that, that people want to get involved in this, and I think have the inclination to. Maybe they weren't sure how they could get involved. Uh, this has certainly produced an outpouring of offers of assistance of all different kinds. We have folks that are, have expertise in, uh, in 3D imaging that are offering their assistance. We certainly have had lots of folks at the local level come forward and say, hey, I'd be willing to take some images, send me a camera. And of course, we're happy to oblige requests like that. And one of the things we'll be doing is reaching out to individuals through social media, Facebook, Lots of photographs on Facebook and sites like that are tagged by geographical location and get everyday people involved in this enterprise of, of fighting back against, against ISIS. And I guess at the beginning of the program, you were sort of talking about uh, how what we're doing matches up against what ISIS is doing. And I think the great thing about it and the reason why this story has become such a global story is because we're not just fighting back in the sense of, of, of eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. What we're doing in our in our in our uh, efforts to fight back is something that's very constructive. By its very nature, it's constructive. We're trying to construct things. So I think people are are captivated by that. That, that our the Western response to what is you know really thuggery and vandalism is something that involves the, the best and brightest minds. Because God knows the people that we're working with at Oxford and Harvard represent that. Uh, but at the same time, it's also something which is inherently constructive. And it's a nice. I think there's a, there's a there's a wonderful contrast there. Well, yeah, it is. And it, it must be interesting for you because usually you're, you're used to doing research and archaeology and that type of thing. You're not used to having a very clearly defined enemy who would kill you to accomplish the things that are the exact opposite of everything that you believe in and everything that you have worked so hard for. It must be an interesting new experience for you, I imagine. Yeah, it is in a way. I mean, I, I'll, I'll get metaphysical for a second and say that archaeologists are always fighting against time, and time, of course, will eventually claim all of us. It's time that erodes the objects as they sit out in the in the baking in the sun, uh, and and so I think that, that there there's always a sense of working against time to some degree. But in terms of having a specific human adversary like this, absolutely not. I mean, one of the nice things about archaeology is I think most people everywhere considered to be an important thing to conserve the past, to learn more about the past, to show connections between people and cultures and places. So it is a very strange and alien concept for someone involved in that enterprise to encounter an adversary who believes just the opposite, that what they want to do is erase history, to break down uh, bonds between people, and to instead uh, insert their own uh, version of the past and make that the, uh, uh, the, the blueprint for the future. So yeah, that, that is a stunning really a stunning contrast with the environment in which we usually operate. 
Well, it's a very exciting project that you're embarking on, and I, I really wish you the best of luck with everything you're doing. Is there a website where people can go to find out more and even donate, perhaps? Uh, we don't accept donations. Uh, all of our funding is private, so we don't don't take any public money or any donations oh. of any kind. But absolutely, we have a, a, a very wonderful uh, website, and it's uh, www.digitalarchaeology.org.uk. Uh, and, um, and yeah, I hope folks uh, could take a look at it and, uh, uh, and maybe uh, get interested themselves. And we're certainly always looking for volunteers. Well, it's exciting stuff, and I'm rooting for you here. Roger, Michael, thank you so much for coming on the show to talk to me about uh, what you're doing with the Million Image Database Project. Yeah, you asked some great questions. Really one of the best. Inter I've done a lot of interviews, and I have to say your questions were really superb, and, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Now, I realize that most of you listening haven't been to Iraq or Syria, and you're probably thinking, who cares about a bunch of old ruins in places that you'll probably never visit? But think about this, folks. ISIS has established footholds well beyond the borders of Iraq and Syria, and much of the most important history of the ancient world is within their grasp right now. They have strategic control of large areas of the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, and the head of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, has explicitly said that they have, quote, a religious duty to destroy the ancient monuments of Egypt, such as the Great Pyramids and the Sphinx. They've established a foothold in the eastern parts of Libya, where they've already destroyed several Sufi shrines near Tripoli, and they intend to target Misrata and Leptus Magnum, which are two of the best-preserved Roman cities in the world. They have active affiliate groups in Jordan, which could put the lost city of Petra at risk, and I don't think that there's any doubt that they would take down the Wailing Wall in Israel, where they also have affiliate groups. And according to a projection map released by ISIS about a week ago, by 2020, they intend to take control of other historically rich countries such as Spain, Greece, Turkey, Ethiopia, and India. The earliest and most important birthplaces of civilization washed from existence. That's what we're looking at here. And if that doesn't scare you, then consider that some archaeologists estimate that ISIS has generated as much as $300 million from the looting of Syrian antiquities. And with the coalition airstrikes degrading or destroying ISIS-controlled oil fields and refineries, ISIS is becoming even more dependent than ever on antiquities as a vital stream of revenue. Every artifact sold puts weapons in the hands of the most sadistic terrorist organization in the world. But if you stop the looting, you stop the flow of money. And if you stop the flow of money, you stop ISIS. Thanks again to Dr. Amr al-Azam and Roger Michael Jr. for coming on the show to talk about ISIS's war on cultural heritage. Be sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes and leave us a review. And don't forget to go on our website or click on the survey link in the show notes to take that listener questionnaire for me. I really want to get a feel for who our audience is, and if you just take a minute to fill that out, that'll be a huge help to me. If you like what I'm doing here, then I hope you'll support Kick-Ass Politics by making a donation on the website or go to gofundme.com backslash kickasspolitics. Because starting last week, we're now ramping up to two podcasts a week, but that also means it's costing twice as much, most of which comes out of my pocket, to be honest, and I'm happy to do the show because I enjoy this, but if you want to pitch in... That's always greatly appreciated and really shows me that you value the effort that I put into this every week. So if you want to help out, you can donate on the website or go to gofundme.com backslash kickasspolitics. And as always, I welcome your comments, questions, gripes, and suggestions at comments at kickasspolitics.com. But for now, I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kickass Politics. This podcast may not be reproduced without express written permission. Kick-Ass Politics is a trademark of Mathis Entertainment, Inc.